to the forces of gravity that are experienced by mass creating an inward pull. So think of the same trampoline, the bowling ball and the marble. If you just drop the marble softly, it's going to go straight into the bowling ball's sort of gravitational well. But if you roll it along the side with a great speed, it'll spin a lot and avoid falling in for quite a while. With the Earth and other things in space that are in orbit, they're just going fast enough to not fall into the object. So for example, the Earth is moving fast enough to not fall into the sun, but it's also moving slow enough that it's not completely leaving the sun and just going off in the other direction and doing its own thing. So in the other case, while well, you have more mass, you have more pull. In this case, if you have more speed, you have more opposition to that inward pull. So that's fine and all. We know these basics about space now, but how do we use these ideas to find the mass in a galaxy cluster? Well, let's talk about this. Think of another example, a spinning ball on a string. If you have a ball attached to a string and you spin it around like in this picture, if the string is too weak, it might break and then the ball is just going to go flying. So you can keep using different strengths of strings until you find the exact right strength of a string to hold the ball into the orbit without breaking and falling away. So if you know the ball and you know the qualities of the ball, how fast it's moving, its mass, then you know how strong the string exactly needs to be in order to hold it in without breaking. That little point between where it would break and where it would break. So we can figure out exactly how strong the string needs to be for this ball. With galaxy clusters, you can do the same thing. You can look at the galaxies as balls and assess their motions and their motion, we can do that. And then we assume the inward force using physics principles. So this is more of a physical method than an observational method, even though we use astronomical observation in the first step. So now that we've done number one, we've picked a galaxy cluster, we've used physics to figure out how much mass is there, we use step number two, which is more like the step of just looking and saying, I see this many galaxies, so it should weigh about this much. The way we can do this is using a mass luminosity relation, which essentially means if something has a certain mass, it usually has a correlated brightness. And this relationship is about one to one because this looks about like a straight line on this plot. So what that means is if we look at an object in space and it's bright to a certain degree to our telescope, we can say, okay, it's this bright, so it weighs about this much. And we can make pretty darn good guesses about how much things, how much mass things have based on the amount of luminosity they give off because of this relation. So when we look at this galaxy cluster, we can collect how much light is coming in and say, okay, however much light this has, follow it over on the plot, and then it can tell you how much mass it has. So this is the other way to measure the mass in the galaxy cluster that we use the other method for right before. So the third thing we do, since the second step is comparatively a bit more similar, we're done with that step, is to compare the results we got from one and two. And intuitively, like I said before, they should match up. They should be about the same. The problem is that they're not. There actually is way more mass from the first step calculated than we see in the second step, which doesn't make sense because we know that the first step, there has to be that much mass there. Otherwise, the galaxy cluster wouldn't be a galaxy cluster it wouldn't be held together, its strings would be breaking, and the galaxies, like a ball, would be flying in all directions, but they aren't. But then when we look and we count how much mass is there, it doesn't barely accommodate for what we calculated is necessary to hold that galaxy cluster together. The problem is that we don't know where this is coming from. 
we don't know what this is, and hence, dark matter. Dark matter is that phenomenon of this missing mass that we can't explain because we can't see, so we can't describe. So let's talk about the first observation of dark matter. This was achieved in 1933 by Fritz Zwicky, and he did exactly what we just talked about. He looked at the coma cluster, he measured the mass with physics, and then measured the mass with the mass luminosity relation, and compared them. And he realized they did not match at all. He calculated that the invisible mass outnumbered the visible mass by a factor of 50 times, which is a whole bunch, given that prior, we didn't think there was anything else in the universe except what we saw. So this was a huge upheaval in the idea of luminous mass being the only mass. It's not. We have now realized that there's something there that we really are in the dark about, no pun intended. <laughs> So he was a very interesting character, by the way. If you ever want to read about him, he's hilarious. But he was very important to the discovery of dark matter. Now, almost 100 years later, we know that dark matter exists not just in clusters like Fritz Wicke found, but they also exist in galaxies. And they exist in these sort of halo forms. So they don't exist in the plane of galaxies, as you might assume, but they exist more in a spherical shape around the galaxy. Um, and our own Milky Way, for example, the galaxy that we are sitting in right now, is 95% comprised of dark matter, which is just insane to think about um, because you can't see it. And yet it's all around us all the time. So another thing that we know today after those near 100 years of research is that dark matter is probably non-baryonic which essentially means it's not the regular stuff that we have around us. It's not protons, neutrons, and electrons, or any of the sort of sister and brother particles of those. It's something completely different because baryonic matter or protons, neutrons, and electrons interact with light. So if you shine light at it, it'll reflect back so you can see it. What we think we're dealing with is a type of matter where if you shine light at it, it just goes straight through and it never returns back to you so you can't see it. We also know it's probably non-baryonic because for one, in order to cause the amount of mass distortion that it does, these groups of um, baryonic matter, if it were baryonic matter, would have to be Earth mass to 30 solar masses, which is very large. And we probably would have seen an object by now, especially for the second reason. If dark matter were baryonic, which means it's matter that interacts with light, even if it were dark, we would be able to see it through backlighting. Which means, for example, if you have something in a dark room, you can't see it if the room is completely dark. If you shine a flashlight behind it, you can't see the thing, but you can see its outline because of the light behind it. And astronomers think that if dark matter was baryonic and did interact with light, we would have seen silhouettes of it by now, even though we might not have seen it directly. However, we haven't found any silhouettes of any kind. It mostly just seems to be invisible. And finally, if it were baryonic, it would contradict these sort of discoveries we have already made about the ratio of elements to other elements in the universe. Um, essentially, particle physicists took the idea of the early universe and said, OK, given the conditions of the early universe, we should now today have about this much of hydrogen, this much of helium, so on. And we see those ratios really well in luminous matter. If there were to be a bunch more of other elements thrown into the equation with this dark matter, if it were baryonic and on the periodic table, it would completely mess up these theories that particle physicists have made. And the main idea is that they've held up pretty well and they make a lot of sense. So to inject the idea that there is this ton of baryonic matter added in now that we've discovered dark matter, it doesn't really jive with particle physics. We also know today that dark matter is usually agreed upon as being cold. And in a nutshell, what this means is that it's dense and that it's more dense than our regular luminous matter. So it slows down quicker, which is important because in the early universe, matter and dark matter were both moving around really fast because the universe was small and hot. So everything was moving around like boiling water, basically. And Dark matter being cold doesn't necessarily mean its temperature is colder, but it's moving at a lower velocity because it's heavier. Think of how a small sports car can move faster, easier than a huge semi-truck. The dark matter is kind of like the semi-truck. 
So when the universe started cooling, it slowed down and fell into place faster than the regular matter, the sports car, because it was still zooming around, because it could, because it was smaller and less dense. So this is actually really crucial to the idea of the present universal structure, because if you look at the universe on a large scale, it looks like this basically, which is a very spongy kind of texture, which is just super interesting. But people think that dark matter must be cold and a little more dense, and that this sort of pattern that we see was first created by cold dark matter slowing down and coalescing into certain areas in the early universe. And then since it has mass and it creates that inward pull that we were talking about, the luminous matter, as it finally slows down, it follows suit to where the cold dark matter went. So it sort of made a map of how the universe will evolve over time. So that's really significant to the idea of the dark matter and the role that it played in the early universe and makes a good explanation for the structure that we see today and the map that luminous matter followed. What we don't know today is a lot. Um, the biggest thing is that we don't know what it is still. There are a few leading theories um, and there's one leading theory and I will get to that theory in the next slide. But I thought that three theories were worth mentioning, even though two of them are still relatively unpopular in the field. So cold dark matter could be a few things. The first option is called MACHOS, um, a great acronym, which means massive compact halo objects which essentially means people think that they are made of baryonic matter. They're just very massive, but they're small, and they exist in places outside of galactic disks. So they live in halos around interstellar objects. So people think these could either be brown dwarfs, which are objects that almost became a star but didn't quite get there, so they're basically really hot planets, or they think that they could be really small black holes because neither of these things give off a lot of light, even though they are baryonic. However, we discussed earlier why dark matter probably isn't made of baryonic matter. So this theory isn't really popular, but some people do still think that it's viable. WIMPs or axions are weakly interacting massive particles. Once again, great acronym. Um, and axions are just a similar type of particle. So these are the literal dark matter that you think of when you hear dark matter. People think that dark matter may be particles that just don't interact with light and they're made of something different that we don't yet understand or have not yet discovered, something that isn't protons and neutrons and electrons. So that's the second theory. The third theory is modified Newtonian dynamics or MOND, which basically throws away the need for the idea of dark matter as a thing, as a substance. What this says is that gravity just acts differently on really large scales, like galaxy cluster type scales. And that explains why things are moving differently and why mass seems to not exist in the capacity that it's required to. Some people think that there's nothing going on except a misunderstanding of basic physics. And once again, this idea is also not very popular because Newtonian dynamics or Newton's physics that he made have worked really well so far in things that we've seen. So a lot of physicists are skeptical of this idea, but there are some people out there who still think that it's a viable option. So the leading theory currently is the WIMPs, ironically, or axions. Um, people think that this is the most likely solution to what's happening. but as we've learned, that implies that dark matter is invisible, so it's really hard to find. And weakly interacting doesn't mean just weakly interacting with light, but weakly interacting with all the particles we see on a daily basis. So they're essentially like invisible ghosts that we're trying to catch, but it's pretty hard because they don't interact with anything else. So that's why dark matter is such a mystery currently, is because specifically it eludes our understanding which makes it all the more enticing to understand. So that's dark matter. So now that we have a basic grasp of dark matter, we know that 4% of the universe is luminous matter and 22% is dark matter. But there's still 74% of the universe left that we haven't talked about. So now we move on to dark energy. So even though we just learned about dark matter and it seems like it comprises everything and luminous matter is just a tiny bit, Luminous matter, or our regular matter, is even less of the universe than we thought it was in the 1930s. Now we know that 74% of the universe, or somewhere around that number, is dark energy. And you might be thinking, what does that mean? 
that the universe is comprised of energy. Energy isn't really tangible like masses or matter. Energy is more of a concept, right? Well, this is where the so-called household equation, E equals MC squared, comes into play. It's called the household equation because despite whatever field you're in, you probably heard of this equation. It's a bit of a pop culture thing, but you might not know what it means. And essentially what it means is that energy equals mass times the speed of light squared, which in a nutshell indicates that energy and mass are different states of the same thing, essentially. If you give mass enough speed, it can turn into energy. So even though the universe being mostly comprised of energy it may sound strange, just remember that energy and mass aren't completely different. They are sort of at their core similar. So let's go over some history again. Let's take a break from the science. Um, what is dark energy? Well, if we're going to talk about what dark energy is and what, it, what role it plays in the universe, we need a little history on the issue of universal expansion. So whether the universe is infinite, finite, whether it's growing, shrinking, or staying the same. So in a long time ago, the Greeks thought that the universe must be finite, which means that it doesn't go on forever, but it has an edge. Their reasoning was that if the universe were infinite, then there would be infinite stars in the sky, and therefore the sky should be completely lit up by stars. But then they looked up and they said, well, not the entire sky is filled with stars. There are some empty spots, some black spots, so the universe can't go on forever. It must be finite. Isaac Newton came along with his idea of mass creating an inward pull, as we talked about, and he reasoned, well, if the universe were finite and there was a bunch of mass in here, it would all inwardly pull in on itself and the universe would collapse in. So he thought that the universe couldn't be finite because then it wouldn't exist. It would have just collapsed onto itself and you would see that collapsing surrounding you if you managed to exist before it collapsed. So he thought the universe was probably infinite. Albert Einstein, even in his time, they didn't quite understand what was going on yet. But Albert Einstein thought, well, the universe should probably just be staying the same because it doesn't make sense for it to be shrinking because we don't observe that and we're all still living and existing. And there's no reason for it to be expanding either. So it must just be staying in this constant shape. And he introduced a term into his equations for that called the cosmological constant, which basically just solved the problem for him because no one could think of a reason why space would have anything opposing the force of gravity to make it stay this one shape. So he said, well, let's just call it the cosmological constant. It's that thing that we need to keep space this shape without falling in on itself. Edwin Hubble realized in 1929, which is around the era of Einstein, they were sort of contemporaries, um, is that one, the universe is bigger than our galaxy, which is unrelated to what I've been talking about, but it's a huge discovery because prior to 1929, we thought that the Milky Way, our galaxy was all there was. And now we know that there are billions and billions of other galaxies in the universe, which completely changes everyone's perspective on existence. So that was a hallmark discovery. And he also discovered that the universe is expanding constantly, which is an idea that no one had entertained prior because either the universe was just staying the same for whatever reason Einstein said it probably was, or it should be contracting because of gravity. No one ever even really considered the idea that the universe might be pushing itself outward and getting bigger over time, because why would it? There was no force that would cause that to happen. And then he reasoned finally that a big bang would need to exist because he said, well, if the universe is this big and say a year ago it was a little bit smaller since it's been getting bigger over time, then a year before that it was a little smaller, then a year before that it was a little smaller. And then he extrapolated that until the beginning of time or the big bang saying that eventually you would get to a single point and then it would have to expand outward from there into the universe we exist in today and its subsequent expansion. So this is sort of how the idea of the Big Bang came about and when it came about. And Edwin Hubble used critical work by Henrietta Swan Leavitt um, and her birthday is today, um, July 4th. So happy birthday to Henrietta Leavitt. She was crucial to this discovery and I'll explain why in a second. And so was Vesto Slifer. So how did Hubble actually come across these sort of ideas. How did he discover that the universe was expanding? Well, 
there are two measurements that he really needs, and these are the measurements of the velocities of galaxies and their distance, and in what direction they're moving, which falls under the velocity category. So these two people were crucial to both these steps. First, for the velocity portion, um, Vesto Slifer came into play. So he had created measurements of redshift, which essentially indicates which direction an astronomical object is moving, because it's caused by the Doppler shift. So as you can see in this picture, if something is moving away, the light it's giving off is shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. And if it's moving towards you, its light is moved toward the blue end of the spectrum. And this is the light version of when a train goes past you and its horn is going off and its pitch increases as it comes towards you and decreases as it goes away. So the sound wave is getting compressed this way and stretched out this way. The same thing happens with light. So the light is getting stretched out if something is moving away from you, and that puts it towards the red end of the spectrum. So you can detect that little red tint to it, if you will, if it's moving away. And how much it is tinted red indicates how fast it's moving away. And the same with blue shifting, except the opposite. So Vesto Slifer had sort of started these measurements, and Edwin Hubble used these to calculate the velocities of the galaxies that he was looking at. The second thing he needed was distance. And this was, Henrietta Leavitt was crucial to this part because she had discovered Cepheid variable stars, which essentially are stars that go bright and dim and bright and dim at regular intervals. And so if they're going a certain speed of bright and dim, you know how bright they should be. And the general rule for finding distance in astronomy is if you can figure out how bright an object should be if it were right in front of you, and then you compare it to how bright it is in your telescope. Since light dims over large distances, you can say, okay, if it's dimmed this much, then it's this far away. So knowing the absolute brightness of something and the apparent brightness of something can combine to tell you the distance. And the only way that Hubble could figure out absolute brightnesses of objects were with these Cepheid variable stars, which Henrietta Leavitt was crucial to. She was amazing. So he realized in 1929 that the combination of these two things when he measured them indicated a linear relationship, which essentially means in this velocity distance relation using Slifer and Levitt's data, he was able to say, if something is this far away from us, it's moving this fast away from us. And if something is this far away from us, it's moving this fast away from us. And it seems to increase, if one increases, the other increases. So that is basically a one-to-one -one relationship of velocity to distance. And this indicates that the universe is expanding. But how does it really do that? Why is it that further objects moving away quicker and closer objects moving away slower, but everything moving away from us? How does that indicate that the universe is expanding? Well, I personally find this hard to explain, but the best image I found to explain this is these images from NASA that picture raisin bread um, cooking in the oven. So essentially, this indicates that, say this is Earth, and these are two galaxies, and this one is closer and this one is a bit further. And this, the bread, <laughs> indicates space, so that's the space in between them. This universal expansion indicates that space itself is expanding. Not that objects are moving, but that the bread or space itself is growing in size, which pushes everything apart. So you can see once the bread has expanded uniformly in all directions, these have moved further apart from each other. So if this is Earth, this has moved away five centimeters because it was initially five and now it's 10. But if you look at Earth in this galaxy and Earth in this galaxy, it has moved 10 centimeters because it went from 10 centimeters to 20. So this one moved five and this one moved 10 in the same amount of time. And since velocity is just distance divided by time and they have the same time interval, since this one traveled more distance, it's going to seem as though it's moving away faster because it moved more distance in that time than this one moved away in that time. But they both look like they're moving away from us. And the important part is also that it looks like this in all places in the universe at once. Since it isn't objects moving, but space expanding itself, if you were to sit on this galaxy, it would also look like everything is moving away from you. And since you know that distant things look like they're moving faster, that implies that whatever is between you is the thing that's expanding. 
So that's how the relation between velocity and distance and how further things move faster and how the further raisins seem to move faster away from the other raisins, that implies that the universe is expanding, space itself is expanding. And this is the idea of dark energy. But wait, there's more. In 1998, both the Supernova Cosmology Project and the HiZe Supernova Search Team both realized that the universe is expanding, as Hubble found, but it's expanding faster over time. Not only is the universe getting bigger, which already contradicted pretty much all ideas in the astronomical field, but as it's getting bigger, it's getting bigger faster. So say one year space increases in size this much, and then another year it's going to increase this much in that same amount of time. So the expansion is accelerating. And this really just threw a wrench in everybody's minds because no one expected that this would happen, let alone that the universe would expand at all. And this is an extremely recent discovery. This was 1998, which is not very long ago at all. So people are still trying to grapple with this discovery and what exactly it means. So they discovered this using type 1a supernovae. So if we remember that the key things you need to indicate universal expansion are velocity and distance, Essentially, these people did exactly what Hubble did, but they used type 1a supernovae instead of Cepheid variable stars. Type 1a supernovae are way brighter, so you can see them at much, much greater distances than the Cepheid variable stars Edwin Hubble was working with in the 30s. Excuse me. So when they could see at much greater distances, they could essentially see into the past of the universe, because the further you look back, the further back in time it is because the greater distance it has to travel, the light has to travel from the object, the longer time it takes for you to get the information. So if an object is very far away and it's emitting light, but it's super far away, it can take years before it gets to us. So when we get this information, it's been years since it was sent. So we're essentially looking into the past. And since these objects, these type 1a supernovae are so bright, we can look super far and look super far into this quote unquote past of the universe. So we can use this to make the same measurements that Hubble made. Um, we can once again take how bright it looks um, and take how bright we know it is because all type 1a supernovae have the same brightness and that indicates distance. And then we can use once again the redshift to find the velocity. So essentially, it's like seeing headlights far away versus right in your eyes when you use this how bright it looks versus how bright you know it is. If you see headlights from far away, they're dim and they're not blinding you. But if you see headlights very close or someone decides to leave their brights on behind you and it's flashing from your um, mirrors into your eyes, you know that they're fairly close. So they know how bright the supernova is. They know how bright they see it. They say, okay, it's this far and it's moving at this velocity. And then they can make a plot similar to this. But what they find is that this time around, it's not a linear relation, but that over time, things are moving faster and faster. So this is how we know that the universe is expanding in an accelerated manner as opposed to a constant manner. So why does accelerated expansion lead to this idea? Why does this matter? Is it counterintuitive? Should the universe be expanding faster and faster over time? Well, let's think about this. Remember our rules about mass making an inward pull. Once again, the reason this idea threw a wrench into everybody's minds is because since the universe is comprised of all this mass, whether luminous or not, it should be having an inward pull on itself since we can see that it's finite. However, it's not. This inward pull from mass is not slowing the universe down. In fact, it's getting faster. The universal expansion acts as though it's ignoring this inward pull of mass or it's much stronger. So you can see that the mass is trying to pull everything in, but this outward force, dark energy, is still persisting at a much greater strength. And this is confusing because we don't know what this dark energy is or why it's there. So what people thought before is that the universe is expanding from the Big Bang, but it's slowing down over time because it's losing its momentum from that initial explosion. What people know now is that the universe is expanding, but it's getting faster and faster for some unknown reason. So something is fighting gravity and we don't know what it is, but that is essentially what dark energy is, is this oppositional force to gravity. And dark energy, since it's only been about 30 years since it was discovered, 
is even more poorly understood than dark matter. The leading theory is that it's a property of empty space itself. Like we talked about how in the raisin bread, the bread is expanding as opposed to the raisins moving, but the bread expanding pushes the raisins apart. Space itself is expanding. And people think that this is sort of the energy of space that makes it expand. So space has its own intrinsic energy. So as more space is created, there is more energy introduced. If you have a certain amount of space and a certain amount of energy with this space, but the energy makes the space increase, you now also have more energy because energy and space are linked together. So this is why people think that as space expands, it's getting quicker because as space expands, it's getting more of the stuff that makes it expand in the first place. This is the leading theory, but there are other theories about what dark energy is. And once again, extremely poorly understood. Many questions about this, possibly more than dark matter. But that is the general state of the field currently. So now we've learned basically the leading theory of all modern cosmology, which is the lambda CDM model. The lambda indicates dark energy and CDM indicates cold dark matter and matter. So when we have that pie chart of luminous matter, dark matter, and dark energy, that is the same as what we're looking at here. The universe is comprised of dark energy, cold dark matter, and matter, and as far as we know, nothing else. But the universe is not meant to be understood by us, and it loves throwing us surprises. So this may very well change within the next year, the next month, or anything of the sort. But currently, this is where the field stands. And that is essentially what we know about the universe in the field of cosmology right now, and what we don't know, which is a lot more. So as I said, I'm a rising sophomore at the University of Kansas, so I'm definitely no expert. So you may very well throw me questions that throw me as well, but if there are any questions, go for it. I can take them now. Thank you. Hey, do we have any uh, questions? I see one comment in the uh, section that uh, complements the excellent program. I think you may have stumped everybody. <laughs> We've got lots of food for thought here. <laughs> yes, a lot. Um, it stumps me as well, so I completely understand. Oh, here's another question. Oh, I see some questions. Okay. Thanks for a terrific presentation. This is an exciting time to be looking or getting into astronomy and cosmology. Definitely. I feel super blessed to be a part of it right now because there's so many unanswered questions. Another question. What is your idea as to what it all really is? <laughs> um, I think the best answer is that I don't know because I think if I assume anything, it will prevent me from pursuing any other options as to what the answers may be. I don't know. I think the best thing is to just say that I don't know anything so that I'm open to all discoveries. <laughs> yeah, good answer. Let's see. Another question. Did, uh, did Einstein ever believe that space is expanding? Um, so he, he was around for the discovery that space was expanding. And the funny thing is, is that, so he had introduced that cosmological constant um, to explain why space should be staying the same. And once it was discovered that space was expanding, he was like, oh, that was, he called it his biggest blunder. That's what you'll read in a lot of articles about it, is that yeah. he didn't think it was expanding at first, although he could sort of tell with his equations, it probably should be, but he just didn't realize how that could make any sense. So he said, well, you know, it's not happening. It's not expanding. I just don't know quite why. Yeah. And then once it happened, he was like, oh, I can't believe I did that. Another question, what is the big argument about Hubble constant about? Um, there are probably a lot of big arguments about the Hubble constant, but the one that I know about is actually um, what my research is going to be focused on, which I'm really excited about. Um, one of the big arguments currently is that there are two values of the Hubble constant, um, and the Hubble constant represents essentially how much of the universe is dark energy. Um, and there are two values. One is, I believe, about 68, and the other is about 72, so 68 and 72 percent. Um, these two methods were found differently, so one of them was found by looking into the very early universe, and the other one was found with more um, close measurements, I believe. 
Um, and people can't decide why we're getting these two different values because both of them seem pretty credible. Um, so yeah, that's something I will be working on in the future, which is really cool. Another comment, uh, excellent presentation. And another person said, I even followed most of it. <laughs> that's wonderful. <laughs> another person says, Rachel, do you plan to pursue this field upon graduation? Pursue this field upon graduation? Yes, absolutely. Um, I will probably be going to lots and lots more school. Thankfully, I love school. Um, but yeah, so right now I'm an undergrad, um, rising sophomore, and I hopefully would like to get a doctorate someday. Um, yeah. Yeah. Another comment, very enjoyable and informative. Thank you. Another person says, this is not an easy topic to present or to discuss. <laughs> I'm not quite, yeah. yeah. Okay, another uh, Facebook comment, curious about whether the appearance and disappearance quantum phenomena could be related to the dark energy. Oh, yeah. I know very little about this on a deep level, but I, I have heard that it's sort of described as a quantum fluctuation, and I think it's related to the idea of particles popping in and out of existence, essentially, which introduces energy into the space. Um, I, that's my general understanding. Okay, here's another one. Could the more rapidly expanding universe be a function of the fact that time, which is an important part of velocity, is being stretched? A warp of space-time. Your guess is as good as mine. It sounds like pretty good reasoning. Um, yeah, that's one of those questions where seems right to me, but I don't know enough to contest it. Yeah. So. Another similar question uh, about your uh, future beyond graduation. And then the second line says, excellent presentation about a very difficult subject. And next, is the intra-atomic space expanding along with extra-atomic space? Are subatomic particles moving apart? Good question. Um, I believe I've had a conversation about this before. Don't take my word as gospel for this, but I believe that it's sort of it works on larger scales than that. Um, I couldn't tell you exactly why, but I believe that that's sort of one of the final things to happen. Um, so as the universe is expanding, things are moving further apart. And it's interesting when you go further and further in time into that expansion. So those are one of the last things to be ripped apart. So for example, first like galaxies and stars will start moving away from each other eventually because of this expansion. And you'll be able to see that. But then these stars will be ripped apart and the individual particles will be ripped apart. And then eventually all particles will be far enough apart that none of them can get close enough to generate heat. Um, and then they won't be able to interact at all. And that's what the current theory, I'm going off on a tangent now, but that's what the current theory of the universe's end sort of is right now, is a heat death. Because those subatomic particles are gonna be some of the last things to be torn apart by this expansion, and then they won't be able to interact or coalesce anymore. Um, that's essentially what I know. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Another comment and question, a logical presentation, exquisite. Rachel pulls lots of items I've been researching, but I always come back to the same question. Where do the bangables come from? <laughs> I don't know what bangables are. I'd have to be informed. I like the word. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see here. Uh, let's see here. Is this ent entropy to an extreme? Um, essentially, I think that's my understanding. Um, so, yeah, entropy just very, very, very far into the future. I think that's essentially what that is. But honestly, the concept of entropy, in my opinion, is really hard to understand. So, again, don't take my word as gospel on that. <laughs> Another question. Uh, recently, there has been a suggestion that the difference between the values of the Hubble constant may be due to the presence of magnetic fields present at the time of the Big Bang. I've never heard that. That's interesting. I'll, I'll have to look. Okay, I would like to like, keep that comment. I would like to look that up. Okay. Is it really heat death if energy is increasing? That's interesting. Um, so it's heat death between things that are not space, I suppose. The idea is that energy is increasing in space, but it's heat death of the things that we interact with, um, like particles and such. Um, although I have also read that some people think that 
once space is expanded to this point, a quantum fluctuation or just like a random sort of happening in this space energetically could cause another big bang. Um, once again, super like hypothetical stuff. But yeah, I think when people say heat death, they mean in terms of like matter that can interact. Y'all are stumping me. You're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Let's see here. Oh, I also forgot to mention that. Um, here, let's go back to this. These are a couple of things uh, that you could read. I made this presentation just sort of from information that I've gleaned from reading and YouTube videos and various classes I've taken in school. Um, a lot of the, pretty much all of the dark matter portion came from this book. Um, so if you want to read that, it's a super great read in my opinion. It's a little old, but I think that most of it probably still holds up. Um, and then here's something good about Hubble's law and like the discovery of dark energy, um, just in terms of the expansion, not the accelerated expansion. Then there's more here on dark energy. And if you want more reading, um, I have other readings. I can, my email is just my name. Um, so the name you see on this presentation probably at gmail.com if you want anything else. Although once again, I'm no expert, but yeah. Well, again, thank you so much, Rachel, for an outstanding presentation. Thank you. And uh, the next presentation will be in two weeks from now. So feel free to uh, tune in. We'd love to have you. And so we will be uh, tuning in. Uh, we will have these uh, programs two Saturday nights per month uh, for the time being. Uh, the next one will be, like I say, on the 18th of July. So thanks for tuning in and good night.